We came home tired and sore, licked our wounds, and began planning our return to Red Rock. The main problem with our Red Rock setup came down to two things. The lower rig was not tall enough to let the ship clear the entire path through the rock formation. We made plans to increase the height of the rig from 6 to 10 feet and higher if needed. The steel braided wires had sagged. We decided to replace them with 3 64ths of an inch music wire, same stuff used in pianos. The strength of music wire is great, it shouldn't sag, and best of all, music wire is slick, and we could drop the idea of towing the replica downhill. We'll let gravity do the work. This time, we would pace ourselves by spreading the chute over two days. Our first opportunity to return to Red Rock was on Friday, February 28th, a month after our January adventure. At the time, the headlines about a possible pandemic were starting to appear, but no travel restrictions or closures were yet underway to impede our shoot. Glenn had re-engineered the rigs to make them lighter and easier to cart and carry to the location. It was still a slog, but better than the month before, and the weather remained on our side. Once again, I climbed the rocky hill to install the upper rig. This is getting old as I'm getting older and tired. The rig went up with the same effort as before, not easy, and on a space of land just big enough for the base. The guy wires were run and attached to the cliffside. One lesson for anyone who is rigging something like this, everyone should have their own set of tools so that time and energy is not wasted hunting for them and running back and forth. The wire we're using now was frozen using dry ice for several days right up to the moment of our setup. The reason is that keeping this wire in a deeply frozen state greatly increases its strength, a process causing crystalline structure migration. But we soon found out that stringing an eight foot length of wire for a piano is vastly different than our now 115 foot run. What is this? The wire quickly became snarled. Got tangled. Just putting it in here got tangled. No matter how I tried, the wire would not cooperate. This was very frustrating because the original braided wire strung quite easily. The advantages of the new wire, strength and smoothness, were quickly becoming a chore and a possible torpedo in our new set of plans. This is a nightmare. Luckily, Glenn brought multiple rolls of wire and by spending hours unwinding a few feet at a time, we were able to run the length of the Gemini's flight path. The new lower rig was now assembled at the base of the pinnacle, much closer than before. We are counting on the increased height to clear the obstacles leading past the main rock formation. Glenn had improved the design by attaching the pulleys directly to the rig's upper frame. Next on our list was to raise the lower rig into position. As you can see, we've more than doubled our original height. Now, we had a very clear path from the lower rig to the upper rig. To test the new rig, Glenn cobbled together a stunt double of the Gemini 12 replica, made from a child's metal snow sled and some PVC tubing. We ran the Lidecker wires through the PVC tubes and then onto Glenn's lower rig, where he used hand cranks to raise the wires and the stunt double. The sled was built to match the weight of the Gemini miniature. It kind of looks like a Star Trek Romulan ship. This is working good. It's working excellent. Yeah. I think we need to take off what? Another foot or two? It was getting late in the afternoon and things were looking pretty good. We decided to forego an actual test with a stunt double and call it a day. We covered our tools and loose equipment and left for another overnight stay in Mojave. Saturday morning, we were back at Red Rock. Because we'd done most of the heavy lifting the day before, all we had to wrangle out to the location was a Gemini replica and a few extra parts. Getting across that dry, sandy river wash was miserable, just like the previous times. The location was in good shape. The weather had been mild overnight and not disturbed our setup. I installed a fusion core in the replica and the radar dome. Remember that I'd made the Lidecker tubes out of copper with the last two inches of stainless steel for strength. This time, a spring was added to each opening to help reduce friction on the new solid wire. Boy, those springs in there really make it easy, don't they? Wrong again, Paul. 
The starboard side spring was preventing the wire from going all the way through. Glenn did some quick router work using another piece of wire and finally the opening was cleared. You'll notice we're adding a foam cushion to each of the wires in front of the tower, just in case the Gemini overshoots the stopping mark and collides with the setup. We ran the two Lidecker wires to the lower rig and began the process of raising the Gemini into the air. We all watched the ship rise with bated breath in hopes that all our connections would hold and that the new wire would do its job. The Gemini silhouetted against the red rock cliffs was indeed something marvelous to see. At that point, it became obvious that we needed to reduce the height of the lower rig to put the Gemini at the same level as the original when it passed the pinnacle. As the new tower is adjustable in height, this was done without any drama. I then went to the upper rig to begin using the fishing rod for pulling the Gemini to the upper starting point. Another snag. Your reel isn't working, Glenn, it's slipping. The fishing reel was tangling the line and it wasn't strong enough to do the job. It stretched. Adam was going to have to pull the Gemini up manually, hand over hand to the starting point while I reeled in the slack. This would have to happen for every take. There was light at the end of the tunnel. Then, we were midway up the rock formation when disaster struck. The starboard Lidecker wire had come loose. Where did it break? It came right off the... It wasn't on there tight enough. I'm holding it. Lower the other side so Adam can hold okay. the Lower ship. The Thankfully, Adam was right below the Gemini and caught it when the wire came loose. If not for his quick action, the ship would have been severely damaged, smashing into the rocks. Say when. That's good. Okay, that's good. We were so close to being ready, but this last minute fiasco might do my plans. I reattached the wire to the pulley and re-rigged the starboard connection. Things were still shaky, and we held our breath That'll do it, bro. as the ship was raised again. I think it slipped. It's over. That's good. Okay, that's, good. that's good. Okay, we're back on track to pulling the Gemini to the starting point. The time was approaching, 10 a.m., roughly when the original shot was done. The sun will not be in the exact same position because of our six week delay, but close enough for our purposes. Not knowing if we were going to get more than one take, Mike has set up three cameras to roll at the same time. A camera is what we call the money shot, with the Gemini passing the pinnacle. This camera will be shooting in slow motion at 120 frames per second. B camera, is facing the formation and duplicating the famous angle of the Gemini heading above the camera. This shot is 30 frames per second. C camera is giving us a wide angle of the cliff formation to capture the ship's entire run from right to left, also shooting at 30 frames a second. Glenn has installed a fourth camera, a GoPro, inside the Gemini replica for a unique one-of-a-kind shot that even Howard Lidecker could never have pulled off in the day We'll see the point of view from inside the ship as it travels down the wires. One more note, we are not using any wire removal software in editing this restaging. Although Mr. Lidecker didn't have that advantage, and neither will we, he did use smoke to aid with the camouflaging of those wires. We wanted to use a drone for additional coverage, but the state of California forbids their use in Red Rock Canyon. Okay, are we ready? It would have been nice, but they let us in to do this outrageous stunt, so I'm counting our blessings. This is it, one take and it's the end of the ship. Okay, John, roll your camera. Rolling. What you're going to see now is an edited version selected from some of our best takes with the engine sound effects added in. You'll see more on the other side, but for right now, we're relaunching the Gemini 12. And action!
55 years from the date of the original filming, months of planning and construction, and three days of production, and we were finally successful. I couldn't believe it. But we had no time to waste enjoying our triumph. The ship needed to be hauled back up so that we could shoot again. Every second a Gemini was wired up as precious because we never knew when something else would go awry. Pulling the ship back to its starting point was a pain, but Adam and I managed to accomplish it in about five minutes per run. Hey, let's look at some of our dailies. Our first take was to make certain the ship cleared all the many rocks, so it is seen here easing past the pinnacle. I'm quite pleased that the fusion core is showing well in the high contrast desert sunlight. The wire was so smooth, we learned it was not necessary to shoot in slow motion. The real-time downward speed of the Gemini was perfect, proving that the original 1965 shoot was not at a high frame rate. In post, we had to speed up the slow motion almost five times to get the right look. We did a total of 12 runs that day, some of them better than others. We noticed some bounce on a take or two that resulted from an uneven start and a little breeze. And the wires were showing up more as the sun moved westward. I think the side angle captured some of the most interesting views of the Gemini as it cruised down the rock formation. And here's a longer view from inside the ship using Glenn's GoPro. Listen and hear the sound of the Lydecker wires as they pass through the Gemini's hull. Glenn managed to take his camera to the opposite side of the rock formation and grabbed some unique angles similar to the takes in the 1965 filming. Paul, come, to, come down here, because I don't think you can see this up there. With all the good takes in our pockets, we decided to wrap the production around 12.30 p.m. as the wind began to pick up. We had multiple trips ahead of us to return the equipment to the parking lot. Our strike was another test of endurance and took nearly five hours. This time we got it all back to the parking lot before dark. What we didn't know is how much the world was about to change. A week after our shoot, the United States began shutting down due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The closures included state parks and Red Rock would be off limits in the foreseeable future. Getting our crash recreation done at the end of February was accomplished before the door was shut. Our video has been in the works for a long time and during the latter part of shooting, the COVID-19 pandemic came to the United States and closed it down. We salute the heroes of the healthcare profession, the federal, state, and city employees, and retail workers who are on the front lines. Our little production had to shut down too. As mentioned earlier, we were finishing Red Rock a week before the situation became an emergency. We feel that sharing this video is not only fun, but relief for those who are soldiering on through the crisis. I hope you feel the same way. Also know that this production was done properly with filming permits, insurance, and communications with park officials. That consisted of an agreement that we leave the area as though we had never been there. No debris, no wrappers, nothing. Now, a few people to thank. Kevin Burns, the man who saved Lost in Space and keeps the flame burning. A big thanks to my son, Adam, not only for saving the ship, but for being a tireless assistant. The park rangers of Red Rock Canyon, David Ice and his friend John Lohr, who shot the invaluable behind the scenes footage from our successful attempt on day three. David had also assisted earlier by providing the GPS coordinates for the location, which he had visited a few years earlier when shooting his own video with a Jupiter II spaceship replica. Thanks to Glenn Loughborough for his engineering and technical support, Mark Myers for his very special model work, to Gene Winfield for his comments about vehicle construction, to John Antonellis, builder of the replica chariot, Mike and Lola Nicker of Q Plus Labs for the scan of the Gemini 12, and Android Don, owner of the original Gemini 12 miniature. I'm Paul Loveletter, and I'm going to take a nap.